let's continue our study of pragmatics. We're going to look at the truth value of sentences and at speech acts. And we're going to look at sentences like, if it's in stock, we have it. So we can classify sentences in two different ways. We can classify them according to their truth value, whether they are true or not, and what kind of information can we suppose from them. We could also classify sentences by why I said them. Maybe I was trying to give you some information. Maybe I was trying to ask for something. Maybe I was just trying to say thank you. This, uh, all of these reasons for why we say something are called the elocutionary force of a sentence. And in general, we're going to call all these speech acts, the act of providing information, the act of expressing an emotion and so forth. Let's start with the truth value. So the truth value is trying to figure out if a sentence is true or not. For example, you can have a sentence that is situationally true, that is true with the necessary context. For example, if I said, my brother is a surfer, the sentence would be true if and only if I do have a brother and this brother is a surfer. So it is true with the appropriate context. There are sentences that can never be true. We call these contradictions. For example, I have a brother and I have no siblings. Both of these things can't be true at the same time and for the same person. So there's no context that's going to fix this. This one is always going to have a value of false because it's not true. We have tautologies, which are sentences that are always going to be true, regardless of context. For example, the first rule of our club is the first rule of our club. This sentence is, is, oh, is a tautology, and you might have heard about tautologies in the context of calling them redundant, because they're providing redundant information. So obviously, the first rule is the first rule. Um, there are sentences like, either you have siblings or you don't which is, I guess, all the possibilities. So no matter what context you have, these sentences are always going to be true. Finally, there are sentences for which the truth value is uninterpretable. There's no way to knowing if they're true or not. For example, in Twas Brillick and the Slithy Toves, the gyre and gimbal in the wave. This is from the Jabberwocky poem from Lewis Carroll. And those words don't exist. It's the same thing as with colorless green ideas. This is a sentence that is grammatically correct in English, but with words and a combination of words that means nothing. So there's no way to know if the sentence is true or not. Why don't you give it a try? These are some sentences in English. Please try to classify them as situationally true, tautological, contradictions, or uninterpretable sentences. Please pause the video. All right, let's see. Um, snow is cold. Snow is cold. Practically all snow is cold. So it is a tautology. Um, because it's true no matter what context you're in. You might be, it might be snow in the spring. It might be snow in the North Pole, in the South Pole. Today is Friday and Tuesday. It cannot be both days at the same time, so it has to be a contradiction. It's always false, regarding, regardless of context. I love pizza is situationally true because it depends on the person. Maybe someone loves it, maybe someone does not. But if, like, if I say it, it would be true. It's, it depends on the context where we're speaking. Cow's milk comes from goats. Nope, it, it can't because it comes from cows. It's a contradiction, it cannot be true. Um, Fluppers and build my scoby. It's an uninterpretable sentence, unless you know what those are, which I don't. Um, goat milk is expensive. The, is a situationally true sentence because it depends on where you are. Maybe you live somewhere where it's cheap. Maybe you live somewhere where it's expensive. All dogs are canines, and this dog is not a canine. Has to be a contradiction because there's no way for the dog to be a canine and also not. And the fleab has all of the fleab juice. It's a sentence that if it's mostly uninterpretable if you've if you've watched rick and morty you might be able to say it's situationally true but in reality it's uninterpretable unless you know what a fleab is all right 
So sentences can be true or false. And from those statements of something being true or false, we can derive more information and eventually build entire networks of information about our world. Two basic types of uh, assumptions that we can make are presuppositions and implications. And we can use them again to gain knowledge about the world. For example, if I say the sentence, I'm proud to be your student, it presupposes that I'm your student. Because I, in order for me to be proud of being your student, I must be your student. So this statement, statement B, is true. And it is also true regardless of whether A is true or not. So I'm proud to be your student. Not really. So let's say A is false. I'm proud to be your student. False. Even then, it would still presuppose that I'm your student. Because in, or in order for me not to be proud, I would still need to be in this situation for me to then not feel proud. This, uh, this sentence is another example of presupposition. I'm sorry the team lost. It presupposes the team lost. In, even if I say, I'm sorry your team lost, not really, it still presupposes that the team lost. It's just my, my feelings changed about it. So these sentences presuppose that these A sentences we suppose that the B sentences are true regardless of whether A ultimately turns out to be true or not. There's still, there's still a mean to derivate this information. There's a slightly different relationship which is an implication. In an implication, if A is true, B is true. For example, Joanne fixed the computer implies that the computer is fixed. Because if A is true, B has to be true as well. Because if she fixed it, it's already fixed. If we, if we did the negative of this one, Joanne fixed the computer. Not really. Um, it would mean that the computer is not fixed. So B would now be false. So this is the difference between a presupposition and an implication. That we, uh, in a presupposition, we can extract some information regardless of the truth of the statement. But for implications, we need one statement to be true before we can derive the, follow, the information that follows. So as you can see, all of this, by the way, is called formal logic. You can uh, get a lot of information from statements and ultimately build a network of knowledge about your world. But you need to figure out if things, if, if the network of information that you're building has true values or false values. By the way, you can combine the maxims that we talked about in the last video with uh, implications, as you can see here in these advertisement messages. So these advertisement messages are a little bit tricky because they're violating the maxim of quantity. They're giving you more information than they need to. And because they're giving you more information and you assume that they're being cooperative, you must assume that there's some implication there, that if this is true and they gave you more information, then this other information must imply that something. Take a look at these uh, messages. Try to figure out what implication is being hidden by the extra info. Please pause the, mess the video. <laughs> All right. So. Again, you assume with the, using the cooperative principle that they're telling you things for a reason, that they're telling you that Campbell's soup has one third less salt for a reason. What are they implying with that? Probably that other soup have, soups have all the salt. Uh, the Ford LDT is 700% quieter. It implies that other cars are louder. Maytags are built to last longer and need fewer repairs. So if someone just said this out of the blue, you would assume they're saying it for some reason. You, you assume that they're implying that the others are not built to last longer and they need more repairs. The Mercedes-Benz are engineered like no other car. You'd assume that they are engineered differently. And the Chevy trucks are like a rock. It means that probably maybe other trucks are not like a rock. So you can classify sentences by their um, truth values. You can also classify them by their by the kind of speech act that they perform. A speech act is um, 
kind of the goal that you have when you say a sentence. You can say a sentence to provide information to someone, to ask for things. And we're going to call each of these the elocutionary force of the sentence. So, for example, you can try to assert something, provide information, like just saying, the house is cold. And maybe you, someone is asking you how the heating of the house is and so forth. The house is cold. You can have a directive speech act where your intention, your elocutionary force, is to issue a command. You can do this directly by saying, close the window. Or you can do this indirectly with sentences like, damn, it's cold here. Or is there a draft in here? So notice that even if it looks like a question, is there a draft in here? Your actual intention is to get someone to close that window. This is your elocutionary force, to give an order. And the speech act there would be a directive speech act. And it can be done directly or indirectly. There's a kind of spe uh, speech act called commissive speech acts, which are committing to some action, like, I'll close the window. By saying it, I commit to closing the window. I promise I'll close the window. It's also a commitment to doing something. You can have speech acts that are expressive, that express someone's attitude about something, like, thanks for closing the window, which is a sincere um, thank you, or maybe, you know, thanks for closing the window, which is maybe sarcastic. Maybe they didn't close the window and you're offended by it. But either one of these is expressing, the, the goal of this is to express your attitude towards the situation. There's many types of speech acts. Those are just a few examples. But in general, I wanted to tell you that there's several ways to classify sentences. One is according to the truth value, whether they're true or false. And depending on whether they're true or false, we can use them to then build uh, one upon the other, and from this make presuppositions and implications and build larger networks of knowledge. We can also understand sentences as messages to get to a goal. You say something because you want to inform somebody about something. You say something because you want to request something. These are speech acts. And the specific thing that you want is your elocutionary force. Maybe you want to issue a command. You want someone to commit to, uh, you want to, commit to some action and so forth. So these are ways to classify something.